Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius? Matters. Giftedness is so much more than an academic label. Podcast. We tend to think of gifted as kids being good at everything across the board. An exploration of giftedness. Originals are nonconformists. Creativity. People who not only have new ideas. Intelligence. They're the people you want to bet on in childhood. I like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. Hey there, welcome to episode 28 of the Mind Matters Podcast. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and today we'll be talking with Mark Smolowitz. Mark is the director and producer of the upcoming film, The G Word. This film tries to answer the question, who gets to be gifted in America and why? Before we jump into our conversation with Mark, we want to thank you for being a listener to the Mind Matters Podcast, and we'd love to connect with you too. So if you haven't already, be sure to find us on social media. We're on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod and on Facebook and Instagram as Mind Matters Podcast. Also, quick thanks to our new patrons on Patreon, Laura, Seth, and Sarah. If you want to be a patron too, you can help us out by going to patreon.com slash mind matters. One other thing, if you haven't already, hit that little subscribe button in Google Play or Apple iTunes to make sure that you don't miss anything. And if you have a chance, be sure and leave us a review as well. That really helps us to grow the podcast and continue to reach other families and educators who are passionate about gifted kids. Our conversation with Mark Smolowitz of The G Word, next. If what you hear on Mind Matters makes a difference to you and your family, consider becoming a supporter. Through Patreon.com, you can chip in to help defray the cost of producing this podcast. Just decide how much you'd like to contribute, and that amount will be placed on your credit card every month. Even a couple of bucks would help cover the cost of producing the podcast and help us promote it to new listeners who could also use our help. Go to patreon.com slash mindmatters and become a patron. And thanks for making a difference. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. My name is Mark Smolowitz, and I'm an independent filmmaker based in San Francisco. And I'm here today to talk about one of my newest projects as a director, which is called The G Word. And it's a film about giftedness, um, intelligence, and neurodiversity. And we're currently in production, and we are aiming at a 2020 festival release. So as we get started, why don't you tell us how the idea for The G Word came about? Well, I've actually been working on this movie for quite a long time. Um, when you know, when I'm the director of something, um, you know, I really go deep. I really have to go deep um, um, by way of, you know, just honoring the people and the stories and the issues that are in play. Um, it is my job. It is my responsibility to become an expert in all aspects of what that word could look like. And with the G word, I mean, you know, it sort of seem, it might seem kind of insane to your listeners, but, um, you know, I, the first emails landed in my inbox in 2012, you know, and here we are 2019. The actual production began in 2015. Um, you know, our sort of big first story that I uncovered was actually down in Los Angeles at an early entrance program at Cal State LA. Um, and I was drawn to that story for a number of reasons, um, in part because it was it was an early entrance program for gifted tweens and teens who you know enter college between ages 11 and 15. And that in itself was interesting. Um, but in at Cal State LA, the population that is being served by EAP there is um, is very diverse. Um, because it reflects, you know, this, the county of Los Angeles. It, it also, you know, involves families who travel there from elsewhere. But, but it's a commuter school. It's a multicultural county. It's you know, multilingual people of all ages. And what was super fascinating with that story is that you had these very bright young children, really, some as young as eleven, who were kind of blending in to the campus. You know, they lived at home mostly with their parents, and they were commuters just like most of the other students. Um, and at that particular shooting, I encountered two very strong characters, Elan and Church, and they constitute one of the more longitudinal stories in the movie. Um, so we'll still be filming with them um, this year. Their story is actually, um, they are both um, transgender and gender nonconforming young people. My interest is in looking at, um, you know, who gets to be gifted and why in America in the 21st century. So that's kind of the driving inquiry. And that inquiry for me is a social justice inquiry. It's also one about education equity. 
And in a lot of ways, it made perfect sense to kind of kick things off, you know, at a public university in California, the state where I grew up, that I grew up in LA, I live in San Francisco, and, and begin that process of sort of unpacking, you know, who are the gifted in America in, you know, in this moment? And what do they look like? Because we know they just don't look like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk, right? No, they, they all come in different shapes and sizes and varieties. Absolutely. Your two subjects, Elon and Church. Did being transgender affect their attitude about giftedness at all? It, you know, became immediately clear that their gender journeys, um, their gender identities, um, were actually part and parcel of how they saw themselves um, with respect to being gifted and with respect to their intelligence. And then along the way, in the last several years, there's just been more and more public discussion about how gender and identity and the brain and giftedness and intelligence and creativity all kind of come together in really interesting and dynamic ways. And so I, you know, I had my gender story. Um, and in, in the case of Elon, um, you know, he's also Latinx. So I was already on this path of looking at these stories through the lens of race, through the re- lens of class, and through the lens of identity. And the sort of guiding principle of the movie is that we want to be as comprehensive and diverse as we can. You know, since 2015, we have been, you know, all over this great nation um, identifying and filming stories that I think are going to surprise and delight people and show American audiences that that giftedness doesn't look, smell, taste, sound, behave, react, engage the way we think it would or should based on stereotypes. And the bigger cross section of diversity, the more complete your story will be. Right, right. If you're not looking for these kids, if you're not identifying them if you're not seeing them because a they live in the wrong zip code or b they're you know the wrong skin color um think of all the the people that we're missing out on who could be doing great great things in the 21st century um and so so that's you know that's the journey we've been on we've filmed at the you know the u.s mexico border i have a story at a school district right on the border in southern arizona in the desert We have a story in northern Minnesota at a tribal school where they have a gifted and talented program. We have a story north of Seattle, which is in a suburban district that has been undergoing, you know, tremendous changes because they're in the backdrop of Microsoft and there's been a mass exodus out of Seattle for more affordable housing. So you have an increasingly diverse student body there. And we have stories in Baltimore. Um, Baltimore has, uh, the state of Maryland has become a really interesting place for us because, um, you know, what I like to share with people is that, um, you know, as, as many of your listeners will know and understand is that gifted is local, right? Much of the, the state of the state for, a, for gifted programs, you know, really is happening at the municipal level, certainly at the state level. And with Maryland, you know, we had a very interesting and diverse state where urban, suburban and rural districts are very close, you know, geographically. And so those uh, stakeholders collaborate in really interesting and dynamic ways. So so I'm, I'm interested in the stories and the people People, of course, but I'm also interested in the advocates and the people who are in the, on the front lines. Um, and I've just been delighted to um, encounter so many generous people who are so passionate about gifted education. Um, the film also, you know, e- early on, we embraced um, twice exceptionality and um, neurodiversity as sort of concepts that we were leaning into. And then I would say that, you know, they really are, you know, kind of a huge focus of our movie. So when the movie is done, you know, you will you will probably be experiencing, you know, upwards of nine different stories in nine different places, you know, public schools, private schools, what I might call innovation schools, um, homeschooling. What I've noticed and what I think, you know, is is, you know, a common belief is that you know, the challenges that face gifted and talented students in our country are happening across all socioeconomic demographics. The social emotional challenges of being gifted in America are not reserved for any one population. Um, and so it was important to me to, to spend time with a vast array of stories and people that could help put a, a diverse face on, on this movie. This will be something of a departure from what we often get in documentary style film. Yes, that's a, I mean, that's a really great way to describe it. I, you know, the film hopes to be not like every other film you encountered about, about education issues. You know, I'm really focusing on the human stories. I'm taking what I describe as a very poetic approach to capturing these stories and sharing them with audiences. Um, There will be some non-traditional visual tropes in the film. Um, I'm very interested and excited about, you know, trying to tell 
these stories from inside the mind of the gifted and twice exceptional person. So I've really embraced asynchrony um, as a visual strategy, and um, that is already playing out quite beautifully. We're at a pivotal point today in education. According to the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, since 1990, the U.S. has fallen in the global ranking for education from 6th to 27th. In math, the U.S. is ranked 38th. Part of the problem is funding, as the U.S. has actually reduced spending on education. Countries passing us are increasing spending. While the U.S. does spend more on average per student than almost any of the countries studied, there are vast inequalities among school districts, and budget priorities in the U.S. differ greatly from countries with a higher rank. Scores are rising in the U.S., but other countries are rising faster. And now, as a new administration proposes to further reduce funding of public schools, larger questions are looming. You know, I've been making this film for for quite a while, and it was a film that I started, you know, under the Obama era, and I'm continued under the Trump era, and that has been a really interesting and important change, and a really you know dynamic shift in sort of how how people feel about education in America, and sort of you know thinking about our education priorities, um, and so. I feel strongly and and quite confident, actually, that our film will join a much larger national discussion about who we are valuing in this society, who gets to be smart, um, what does it mean to contemplate intelligence, um, you know, in the backdrop of a country that has become so, uh, you know, virulently anti-intellectual. These are the are the big sort of, you know, kind of heartfelt theoretical questions that are at the center of the film. And I think um, the 2020s are going to be a really interesting decade, Um, you know, when it comes to neuroscience and the brain science. um, We're learning so much about who we are and the complexity of our, you know, our experience um, in this century. And I think education has to be right at the heart of of those inquiries. Um, And it's no small thing that so many families around this country in all 50 states across the social strata are opting out of school entirely um, in this moment. Um, And that's not something that a lot of people really want to talk about. Um, You know, you kind of can't blame affluent families for going the private school route um, to get their children's needs met, right? You know, when you send a child to school, you want that child to do well and have a wonderful experience and thrive and come and not come home crying (laughs) or feeling bullied, right? And so my view is, yeah, if I, you know, wealthy parents, yeah, they're going to pay, pay for what they need to pay for to make sure their children, you know, are safe and thriving and surviving in school. Um, And then the less affluent families, those are the ones where we really have to think through, okay, well, what do those supports look like? You know, I'm personally extremely interested in a concept of of, um, excellence gaps, um, which, you know, came to the forefront recently in a book by Jonathan Plucker, who's also an advisor to our film. Um, And it really starts with the idea of poverty and how children in poverty, you know, um, who are also gifted and talented, um, you know, have very unique and special needs and how by addressing those, we can really, you know, lift up entire populations that, you know, would benefit from those sorts of changes, you know, to how we identify and how we um, approach gifted ed in general. Um, so there's amazing people doing amazing things that are pushing us in the right direction. Um, Jonathan Plucker reminds me in conversations that we've had that the concept of diversity in gifted ed is not a new one. But now I think we have the benefit of um, incredibly powerful leadership. Um, People like Joy Lawson Davis, who I know was on your podcast um, not too long ago, she's actually a main character in our film. And, you know, we've spent quite a lot of time together figuring out, well, how do you put the black intelligent experience, you know, at the center of a movie like this? Um, I interviewed Joy um, in Richmond, Virginia, where she lives at, you know, Virginia Union University, where she was a professor for gifted education. And it's a historically black college. It was an amazing interview and we totally bonded. I mean, you know, she's a she's an amazing, amazing person. She is. Yeah. We love talking to her. So in sitting with her, she started to tell me about a gentleman called Martin Jenkins. Very few people even know who Martin Jenkins was. Um, And Martin Jenkins, you know, among other things, he was the president of Morgan State University in Baltimore. 
um, which is also a historically black college. He pioneered very early on in the 1930s and 40s um, rigorous academic research um, looking at black intelligence, working with black gifted children, um, you know, gi giving them standard IQ tests, um, proving that they were smart, as smart as their white counterparts. Um, and his work is um, you know, challenged eugenics, challenged um, racism inside higher education. He's actually like a vitally important, important figure in the 20th century landscape of education that very few people even in the black community know about. Um, so our film is sort of, you know, unearthing people like him who are major contributors, lesser known heroes, um, people who pushed um, education and the culture in a direction that that really brought us to, you know, where we are today. Um, the National Association for Gifted Children, um, with Joy and other Black scholars, some years ago, they created the Martin Jenkins Scholarship for young Black gifted students. So we started first by meeting Joy in Baltimore, and we spent time at, you know, the Martin Jenkins Archive. So there's actually an archive about this man and his life and his work at, Mor at Morgan State. And the team there and the researchers who are committed to making sure that um, mainstream education knows about his his contributions to giftedness. And, you know, there are great characters there. The archivist Ida is a, an amazing woman who is so passionate about the, the Jenkins um, journey. Um, and, and so Joy gets to meet with them and that team in the film. And it's a, it's a beautiful moment of sort of celebrating, you know, African-American contributions um, to education. And we also had her meet with a young black gifted kid named Santino from Baltimore, who has been able to access some pretty unique opportunities that are in Baltimore because the Center for Talented Youth is there. So, you know, without getting too complicated, you know, the, the film is trying to make these kind of lush connections between some of the larger systemic players like the talent development centers at major universities, how they serve, you know, um, children by giving them advanced learning opportunities, either through summer camps or, you know, other, you know, other special opportunities. Um, you know, the CTY or Center for Talented Youth is at John Hopkins, but there are others at Duke um, and at Purdue and, you know, around the country. Right. And so Santino is um, one of, you know, very few young black kids in Baltimore who get to experience the CTY offerings in their public schools through advanced learning opportunities. And it's called the Baltimore Emerging Scholars Program. And so, you know, I'm someone who believes strongly in the power of history and knowing our history and knowing where we come from. And so I thought to myself, well, Santino is such a great kid. He's such an amazing character. Um, he, he and his family have no idea who Martin Jenkins was. What if we create this kind of legacy moment in the film where he meets Joy, he gets exposed to Martin Jenkins, she gets, they both get to be at the archive and something magical happens. And my instincts were absolutely 100% correct. It was a really, really special experience for all involved. Um, and then the sort of story continued this year at NAGC in Minneapolis, where we went to meet and interact with this year's Jenkins scholars. Wow. Not surprising, both of them are amazing young people. Um, you know, one is uh, named Haviland, and she is from Nashville, and she's 16. She's already this the teen poet laureate of the state of Tennessee. The other is John, and John is from uh, South Carolina, and uh, he's 13 and, and just a remarkable young man. Um, so we filmed the uh, Martin Jenkins Scholarship Ceremony. I spent a lot of time with them as, um, in interview, getting to know them. They blew my mind. The next day, though, that was this was super powerful. Um, I brought together both families, from, you know, uh, Haviland and, and Haviland's family and John and his family, and with a group of all of the sort of leading black scholars and giftedness who were in attendance at the at the convention and it wound up being a room of about 16 people and we had a very powerful filmed conversation about what it means to be black and smart in america and these are some of the top black scholars in the country um and you know we heard things from them like you know being the only african-american tenured professor um in their department and how that is really difficult and often very marginalizing um, we heard things like, you know, these are these are some of the leaders in gifted ed for people of color, and they can't get their own kids correctly identified or supported in their local school district for all kinds of difficult reasons. These folks often experience imposter syndrome, even as you know they live and work in gifted and cannot get their gifted child the right sort of services. These are the kinds of discussions that the the gifted communities, you know, the traditional and official gifted communities have 
been struggling and working hard to have for many years, and I hope the movie can can really play a part in advancing them. You know, parents, teachers, counselors, families, they all understand the struggle that gifted kids face. But a big part of the challenge is getting a foothold with people who are in a position of power. You know, none of this is easy or automatic, right? And I think that, you know, there's ebb and flow in leadership and, you know, it, it can often be very contingent on a, on a, you know, whether a principal is open to it, uh, whether a superintendent is open to it. These are, these are people who have a lot of power and are gatekeepers. Um, you know, those are sort of bigger systemic things that are, are very, very hard for a movie to really sort of, you know, make a dent in, in change. J- 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 oh, come on. You can't just fix this with it. <laughs> well, I'm, I, this is, I'm going somewhere with this. I mean, obviously, I'd love to fix it um, and, and be a part in fixing it. And so, so the movie on its own, you know, can't fix it. But, you know, we can certainly do a great job of telling the stories that we think are important and powerful that can sort of highlight these discussions. And then the next part of it is what I call the impact campaign, the, the, the sort of outreach and engagement at a national level around the movie. So I'm and I'm not just a good filmmaker, dare I be so bold, but I'm also a good impact producer. Mm-hmm. So helping a movie come off the screen into communities to help change hearts and minds and you know about important topics and sort of support these discussions. So, you know, when we are done, you know, we're going to have hopefully a top-tier festival release so we can give the film the right sort of profile. Um, you know, we'll also aim for, you know, lots of traditional and commercial distribution pathways. Um, but the piece that we're really committed to is working with the gifted community in every state to show the movie and create an event around it and let the movie become a kind of convening moment in local communities where they can use our stories as a springboard to have local discussions about their stories and their issues. Yeah. I mean, imagine an event where you screen the G word, it's incredibly inspiring, and then everyone just leaves and nothing happens. You know, that doesn't serve anyone, right? But reimagine that event where you screen the G word and local journalists, local advocates, local educators, local parents come together and we have a panel discussion that really highlights the challenges, the opportunities, and also the successes in in those local areas. Um, you know, because we are, you know, really the you know most comprehensive gifted movie ever. <laughs> I think um, we hear from everybody. You know, we're hearing from well, we're hearing from people all over the world. I mean, people want me to come film in Singapore and Switzerland, and you know, and I'm I'm delighted. There's so much worldwide enthusiasm, and this is really an American film in a lot of ways. Um, I've I've struggled with that a lot. Like, do I do I need to have an international story? Is it, is that important? Um, what we are doing is we're actually going to hopefully have a presence at the World Council on Giftedness, you know, gathering, which is in Nashville in July. So that'll open us up, I think, to some international voices, which I'm excited about. But but this American movie really, you know, hopes to send a message that there's so much work to do here. And, you know, what what giftedness looks like in New Orleans is going to be different from Seattle, is going to be different from a small town in Iowa, is going to be different from a very rural setting, you know, near in the desert near the border. Um, So I think the movie, like I said, the movie can be this convening opportunity to get people together, to get the movie off the entertainment page and into the awareness page. I'm also intrigued by some of the thought leaders you've interviewed and the movie's historical perspective. Absolutely. We've sat with some of the most influential um, leaders in the gifted community, and they've agreed to be in the film. And it's it's this incredibly special thing because it's some of them are aging in, you know, they're post retirement, you know, they're, but they're still, you know, doing amazing work and, you know, showing up at conferences and, and you know, going on four or five decades of being, you know, leadership in this movement. Um, the movie will have a huge history arc and we'll kind of move in and out of that to kind of keep you grounded in how did we get here today? How did we arrive in 2020 with all this stuff? Um, I feel so fortunate, Emily. I, myself and my producers and my team, you know, we decided to undertake this movie um, in a really dynamic moment for these communities. Um you know, parents and families and districts are self-organizing around these opportunities and challenges, doing amazing work, um, pushing their school districts, you know, to to rethink gifted in the 21st century. Um, you know, it was set aside for a lot of complex reasons, which we'll touch on in the movie. Um, you know, in the 70s, I benefited from, you know, good gifted ed in public education, right? I was that kid. I was pulled out twice a week and, you know, you know, really was sort of supported in my journey. 
Um, not everyone was. That's that's a, another discussion. But you know, move forward into the '80s. There wasn't you know the Reagan administration eviscerated public education, and so gifted ed was one of the first things to go right because it was you know that was a very early moment where um, in in modern education where we embraced this you know very false notion that gifted kids are smart they'll be just fine, and you hear that you know that trope a lot. Oh, well, then came along the 90s and, you know, the Clinton era was all about egalitarian education, multiculturalism and diversity. And while that was such an important and great set of, of priorities, um, it actually sort of slammed the nail in the coffin on gifted ed even further because it was, you know, reinforced this idea that it was elitist. Um, and in, in, especially in an environment of diminishing resources all the time, where education is always fighting to have every last penny that it can. Um, and and we, we became a country from the 70s onward that was entirely focused on deficits, you know, the disability communities, special ed, you know, these were our priorities and with very good reason. Um, and then comes, you know, uh, No Child Left Behind in the early 2000s. You have this important and devastating shift, I would say, um, towards testing as the benchmark for everything. And so schools become, you know, testing factories and that having their funding tied to that. And we know that that isn't a very inclusive process. Um, and so, you know, here we are finding ourselves, you know, at this moment where, um, you know, we have a lot of opportunity to rethink all of that systemic stuff that didn't serve these kids. Um, I think what's very exciting is that more and more you have special ed and gifted ed talking to each other. You have them collaborating. That is so important in my view. I think twice exceptionality and neurodiversity is responsible for making those connections for people. Um, I often have been heard saying that 2E is the savior of gifted ed. Um, because in the um, IEP process, you now have gifted education coordinators in the room and you have twice exceptional students in more and more um, being taken seriously, um, you know, for their strengths as well as their weaknesses. Um, and that being sort of, you know, a baked in part of the IEP process. I think we're just going to see more and more of that because guess what? more and more people are are neurodiverse and twice exceptional than we've ever understood <laughs> and and this is going to become a noticeably important underserved population more and more um for those of us who are in it and thinking about these ideas it's you know it's like such a focus i think most people in the fields continue to be fascinated by this perception of giftedness as elitism mm -hmm. and when you add in this whole anti-intellectualism attitude among some people in this country you're going to be fighting that as well in fact, early on, I, I describe it as the eye roll, you know, that I was getting from, pe from people that I love and respect who, who love and respect me and were like, you're making a movie about what? You know, and it just seemed like, hey, don't you roll your eyes at me, <laughs> you know, um, or, or, or more to the point that if you're rolling your eyes at me and we respect each other, you know, then there's something going on here. Right. And something, you know, interesting and complex and nuanced, because you know, when, when people start to roll their eyes, it's because there's really more in play than we think. Um, and so it just it just kind of gave me a stick to itness around, you know, the importance and relevance of, of these stories and this exploration. Um, it also felt like, wow, there's a lot at stake here because I don't want like huge swaths of the American documentary audience to just write off this movie. Right. You know, I want the movie to be a hit. <laughs> you know, I want the movie to be seen widely. And I want it to make sense for, for many more people than not. Um, and so that's the big task at hand. Um, how do you keep the eye rollers in the room right. and make, make them feel like they're a part of this um, exploration? Um, so when did you first get intrigued by the subject of giftedness? I mean, my early sort of exploration around around gifted was very much through the journey of, um, you know, connecting with Linda Silverman and the Gifted Identity Center in Colorado. And um, my producer had really warm relationships there. And so that was, you know, that was my my first sort of formal entry into gifted was really through profoundly gifted families and, you know, or PG families. And I actually went to a PG retreat in Colorado. And, and, and this, I say all this stuff, you know, wrapped around with so much love and respect because that's how I roll. But you know, a lot of those families didn't do themselves a lot of service because they did a lot of sort of self-isolating from the larger community and a lot of and larger education milieu. Um, and, and for good reason, I think a lot of them, you know, did, you know, were very protective of their children, you know, um, these bright, talented, extremely smart kids who were extremely at risk for all kinds of things. And 
so you, you you can't you know blame families or parents for wanting to protect their children. But what I understood then was, hmm, here are communities that have been talking to themselves about themselves for more than 30 years. How can we change that dynamic? And how can the movie be a helpful partner or ambassador around telling these stories and getting these issues either A, taken more seriously or B, given the focus that they deserve um, so, so families aren't forced to self-isolate? So you're in your final push with production and you're taking a crowdfunding approach to finance this project. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, you know, look, Kickstarter, for those of you of your audience who may or may not be familiar with crowdfunding, um, um, the most competitive platforms like Kickstarter are sort of, you know, uh, raise it all or lose it all. So, for example, if you set a, a goal of $40,000 to raise money for a film or a project, if you raise $39,999, you don't get the money. Right. So that's, you know, that's an important thing for people to understand that, you know, if they're listening and they think they're not a potential donor or a potential backer, they actually are. Because even if they gave us a dollar, <laughs> you know, they're moving us in the right direction as we attempt to meet our goal. Um, as I'm sitting here in San Francisco working with my team to plan this Kickstarter, I'm going to, you know, cautiously say on record today that we may set our goal much, much higher than that, maybe 75,000, maybe 120,000. And because we need the money to really advance the movie and stay on schedule and, and you know, make this movie the magical thing in 2020 that it hopes to be. Um, and how do we get there? Well, it's about that word, that word, that word is the crowd. When you crowdfund on Kickstarter, you start with your friends and family and, you know, people who love you and support you and care about your work. And, and for some people, you know, that's 20 people. For some people, that's 2000 people, right? And because I've, you know, I've been making movies for a while, I have some audience and some people who care about the work. And, and we have been at this with the gifted world for quite a few years. So we have partners, we have advisors, we're going to activate people all over the country to help us touch the crowd. Um, the, the, there'll be that moment, you know, um, during the Kickstarter when we get that first donation from someone that I've never met, that I don't know, that have, we've never heard of before. And as soon as we cross over, you know, to that person, then we started to reach the crowd. And, and that's really the goal. Um, I mean, you know, right now we have... Um, more than 1,500 likes on our Facebook page. Imagine if all 1,500 of those people could really be converted into supporters at whatever level is comfortable for them, right? So I think that that's the, that's the takeaway here is that, you know, every dollar will make a difference. And we want everyone to feel invested in um, the urgency and the timeliness of getting this movie out in front of a dynamic public. Um, and Personally, I'm both nervous and excited that the film will likely, you know, begin its journey in 2020, which is going to be a, you know, tumultuous presidential election year, to be sure. Um, but maybe that'll provide us a platform to really get education and gift education in particular, you know, on um, the public radar again. Um, there are very few candidates, you know, Republican or Democrat or otherwise, that actually put gifted ed on their platform. Um, you know, and I think we need to think about that, you know, and how to encourage that. Um, and the Kickstarter, not only will it be a chance to raise a lot of money for the movie to move it forward, but also a real awareness moment for Gifted Ed in general. So um, I'm excited about that. And people can follow your progress on social media. Where can they find you? Yeah. So the G Word film is on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Um, you know, I really encourage you to connect with our social media because we're, we're really trying to um, crowdsource a lot of diverse voices and perspectives into our our social storytelling and um, you know we love you to engage and tell us what you think um, it's also where we'll be posting videos and you know all kinds of great stuff I'm going to be releasing two new videos during the Kickstarter which are really special videos that I'm excited to share with people one of which is the story sent, set in um, San Luis Arizona at the border and the other is the story of the Jenkins, uh, the Martin Jenkins arc. And so these will be nice kind of eight minute videos that I, I, you know, I, I make these videos when I'm making a movie like this, because it's important to, for me as a filmmaker to kind of figure out the stories, but also to do that in front of my audience and in front of my funders, you know, so people are kind of giving me feedback and, you know, as I'm making the film, I don't want to be heads down. I want to be connected to community and connected to people who care about these stories. Um, and then of course I am on social media as, um, at Mark Smolowitz and I have a company called 13th Gen and we're on social 
social media. So, so just search us in those usual places. I'm on LinkedIn. I use LinkedIn a lot. Um, I, I love Facebook, even with all the sort of complexity that Facebook has, has come with in recent, recent months. Um, and Twitter, you know, Twitter's amazing because like education activists are on Twitter and it seems like Instagram has really taken over the world. So, um, photos and videos are, you know, are a big part of how we want to get these images out there. So we're, we're, we're enjoying playing with all, all that stuff. There have been some pretty successful films about gifted people. Goodwill Hunting, A Beautiful Mind, and most recently, the movie Gifted. But not very many documentaries. So there's a really good opportunity here for people to take a peek inside the real world of giftedness. And for those of us who are already inside to get a glimpse of ourselves. Everyone is in the room. That's a, that's a phrase that I say a lot, and I, I kind of I'm always touching back to it. Um, you can't you can't be all things to all people, but hopefully you can create sort of a story enterprise where people feel welcome. They you know they may not see exactly themselves or their exact experience, but they they have points of entry, um, and that's that's really what the G word hopes to be about. Um, the title being, you know, sort of, you know, case in point, like I knew that the word gifted had tons of baggage, was creating that eye roll. And I wanted to, you know, the G word was meant to be this kind of open ended exploration of what gifted can look like in this century. And and I think it's the right title. You know, we um, even as we look at trends in, you know, that are sort of like what I call the anti gifted people, you know, or ungifted or you know, people who are focused on grit and growth mindset and say that gifted isn't real. I'm trying to keep all those perspectives in the film, but in a way where giftedness and gifted and talented education remains the absolute focus. Mark Smolowitz, thanks so much for being here. This has been such a treat. What a lovely conversation. And I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and thanks to your listeners. And um, have a great 2019. More coming up. If what you hear on Mind Matters makes a difference to you and your family, consider becoming a supporter. Through Patreon.com, you can chip in to help defray the cost of producing this podcast. Just decide how much you'd like to contribute, and that amount will be placed on your credit card every month. Even a couple of bucks would help cover the cost of producing the podcast and help us promote it to new listeners who could also use our help. Go to patreon.com slash mindmatters and become a patron. And thanks for making a difference. The G Word film is one step in a larger goal of bringing the needs of gifted students out of the shadows. Whether it's making sure that services are equitable and accessible to all students, or eliminating the stigma that gifted education is elitist or unnecessary, there is an army of people working to advocate for this progress. A big thanks to Mark and his team for creating this important documentary. If you'd like to support the G Word film, the Kickstarter campaign runs until April 28th. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on Mind Matters. Today I'm trying something else I put my fears on the shelf And the voice is done and I'm safe and sound And I know I'm walking the new path now I'm just gonna spread my wings You know from this day on I'm gonna live my dreams Today's my lucky day Thanks for listening to the Mind Matters Podcast. To learn more about us and our mission, go to mindmatterspodcast.com. You can find us on Apple iTunes, Google Play, or anywhere podcasts are available. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a positive review. We're also on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod, and on Facebook and Instagram, it's Mind Matters Podcast. If you'd like to help keep us moving forward, consider making a monthly contribution at patreon.com slash mindmatters. Every little bit helps. The executive producer of Mind Matters is me, Dave Morris. And on behalf of everyone here, thanks for listening. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.